Hi everybody, I'm Christian. Welcome to the penultimate episode of this tutorial on how to make a roguelike with Pico 8. As always, I have to do a typo at the beginning or it's not an episode of this tutorial. So as I said, today is going to be the penultimate uh, episode. So this means we're going to go through a bunch of bugs that we discovered uh, throughout this throughout the series that you guys posted down in those comment sections. I also did a playtesting session myself and noted a couple of things. I have a whole list here. This time a different notebook. Oh, I just I love it so much. It's a new notebook I got from Nuna. I've not been sponsored by them, but they're really awesome. And if they're going to send me free notebooks, I will go for it. <laughs> Please send me free notebooks, Nuna. Anyways, um, what I was talking about, yeah, some bugs that I discovered. I had like a list of bugs here. Um, and um, then that's going to be the penultimate episodes. On the final episode, episode 51, we are going to maybe discuss the future of the project, what you would do if you're going to continue to work, continue working on this one. This is not a finished game. It's working, but I wouldn't consider it a finished game. I think there is some polishing touch touches that, uh, that the game is still missing. But also, uh, when you continue working on this game, you would have to actually dig into some gameplay stuff, some game design kind of stuff. And um, that would get like um, that. That would get into like a lot of game development, like, you know, a lot of testing, a lot of a lot of theorizing. And it's, this is generally supposed to be a tutorial. You know, how to make tactic, how to solve technical issues. Not so much about you know how entire game development works. This is not we develop a game together. This is a tutorial how you would make a game. What are the first steps and how to get started? And then I think at this point I can let you go and do your own thing. Also, at this point, the seven day roguelike challenge already started. I think like the official start is like tomorrow. So we have to like end it here and I want to continue working on this on my own. Okay, guys, uh, I did some changes here. So this is not exactly the um, game that we had on a, on a last episode. First of all, one big change is I restructured a little bit the sound, the music stuff. You can see this is now the bass part. It's at zero. It used to be on the very last pattern. Now it's the pattern number zero and I shifted all of the music by one. So this is now the normal music that used to start at zero. And the reason for why I did this is because we're gonna do some really cool changes on how, how the music works. We had like some discussions. Uh, I discussed this real quickly that, um, that I want to change a little bit some of, some of how the music works. Another big thing, and a lot of you um, let me know Mm, that's, I was really glad that you guys noticed this. I actually noticed it myself after, uh, before uploading on last episode. So if you downloaded the uh, file from the last episode, this is a, f a bug that was already fixed there, uh, but it wasn't fixed on camera. So um, this is already fixed here. Uh, I think uh, this, this part here or this foo, one of those I, I misspelled, one of the, the stuff here. So we have to cross check if food and foo is meshes food and food here. Uh, because what it did then, it didn't actually delete any uh, used food names from the food um, uh, array, so foods could uh, repeat themselves. And I noticed that very, very quickly and fixed it right away. All right, so let us start going through some of the some of the um, big mistakes. Um, I noticed right away place chest has a bit of an issue. Place chest, that's also some, some of you that noticed that um, there's a there equals 10 that we can remove now. And that gives us the um, that gives us the good the good uh, token safe. Actually, we can go even further than that. We can here and, and we can do do a ternary in here. So we can go like if um, uh, rare and twelve or ten like immediately in here. So we don't need this entire variable. Saved a bunch of tokens. We are actually quite good in our tokens. Um, so, so all of our token saving that was actually that was some some really good stuff. So, so you know, I'm 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 not I'm not complaining. I'm not complaining. Uh, we could even put these two in, in one line if I just noticed, but whatever. The one big issue uh, big issue that I'm gonna fix right away. We noticed that monsters are facing the wrong way. I prepared something. I'm sorry. Uh, I, did, I did it in Photoshop, Photoshop real quick. I basically turned all the monsters around that that were facing one direction. I turned them all around in a different direction. 
This monster is kind of weird because he has, I think his tentacles are in front of them. It's kind of like, some of the monsters are very ambiguous in which way they're looking, especially slime here is, is very ambiguous. Also, this guy is very ambiguous, but all the other ones are now facing the same direction that our guy is facing. We could actually flip the guy around as well. That would be probably even easier, but whatever. Like, they're all facing in the wrong right direction. You could also solve this by code, but that would cost us probably like a token or two. So I decided to go this way around. Uh, there's a couple of big issues that surround the way we did... Um, our on our previous episode where we did like the we added like the star score function it's not my favorite function in the world I have to admit this is mm, yeah it's it costs a lot of tokens it's mm, but also I did some some mistakes here so one one important mistake is this star score function should return a minus one if if it's next to a room and then it should this should be considered as a potential starting position but that's actually not something what's happening here so it returns the score and it should actually be like okay if um if temp is smaller than slow and score is greater than uh, greater equal zero so like minus one score won't be considered as a potential candidate for the uh for the starting location that's something that we haven't added here um, but maybe more insidiously, um, and you know, this is like really just polishing, but um, there is a bit of an issue here. This next to room function is actually not correct in our this specific case. I did some like stress testing and realized that every now and then um, the um, freestanding function will consider like corner tiles of rooms as potential starting lo location, just the corner tiles. That's because the next to room function just looks at uh, the um, cardinal directions. It doesn't look diagonally. So it would be nice if next to room also looked diagonally, but not always, you know, it's not always some, something that you want to be doing. So we kind of have to upgrade next to room to be a bit more um, smart. Uh, something I would maybe do here is like um, go direction, deers, and then local deers, equals deers um, or um, four. So deers means directions, and then I'm gonna plug deers in here. So if I want to, I can uh, go next to room eight, and that gives us also the diagonals. And then star score, um, yeah, there we go. And then here, for the sake of this starting position, we're going to look for the diagonals as well. That would um, eliminate all of the starting positions or potential starting positions that are in the corners of the rooms, even if they're freestanding, whatever, for whatever reason. It's a rare bug. I've been playing this game for over two hours and I haven't encountered this even one time. Even it hasn't even considered the minus one star scores. It doesn't matter. Like this is just generally like a very, very rare situation. And even if you start in, in, in a corner of the room, even if you do that, it's fine. It's, it's, it doesn't look broken. It's just like a weird starting position. It's not like it doesn't break the game. So that's fine. While we are here, I think there's some terniers we could place. Um, I don't want to spend too much time with terniers. I think we can... Oof. There's, there's a lot of here, but I think here we could do something like um, return. Um, SCR smaller than eight and three or or zero. That's the ternary right there. That, oh, by the way, it's not ternary. It's ternary. If there is no I in there. Somebody suggested that to me. <laughs> one, one of the guys from the from Discord channel. He was very embarrassed about that. Thank you so much for suggesting. Oh, I mm, I would have like talked about ternieries until the end of the world, but it's ternary, 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 ternary. Okay, it's gonna be difficult to unlearn this. Let's see if this works. By the way. So this looks good. Why we hear no uh, no music? That makes sense because we are. Starting the music at the wrong position, I think. Yeah, that makes sense. Good. Okay, yeah, because we shifted all of the music, now we have to actually reconsider them. Let's do the music now. Um, so we shifted the music. So now this bass loop that we had at the beginning, that is happening not at 63, but at zero. And likewise, the the music, the actual music starts here. 
uh, here it would, it would start at one. However, I want to do a crazy hack. So Lori from the comment section, uh, she always likes makes those really good suggestions. And this time this was a really good idea. I, I was like blown away because I, this is a, a, an issue that I always have, where it's like, how can I like transition from one music part to another without, because it's kind of difficult to see where a music ends and so forth. And she suggested something that was really good. And that was um, to basically modify uh, modify the music itself to modify this all these settings here using code and you can do that there is no built-in functions for that but pico 8 is, is kind of like designed to be extremely hackable so everything that is happening with pico 8 is completely exposed to you with some crazy interfaces they're called poke and peak uh, poke allows you a peak allows you to look at some part of the memory of the computer that is pico 8 and see what's in, what's in every you know single part of the memory, and uh, poke allows you to change that memory. So what we have to do is to find out where the music is saved, where the music files uh, data is saved in the memory, and modify it so we can, for example, and that was her suggestion. Um, so you have this loop, right? And it's set to loop constantly, uh, just like on itself. Just like constantly loops, right? So she suggested that we just turn off this arrow when we want to transition to the next song. That would make the pattern transition from zero to zero one, and then you know the normal music would continue playing. That's such a good idea. And then uh, when we when we die and we want to bring back the loop, we just turn 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 this button on again. Wonderful. So I did some research and there's like some some data on this on the forums. Some people did already the, the homework for us, so we don't have to figure it out. But yeah, here is here's the code for this. So uh, at the beginning, when we actually start the music, this poke uh, 0x31019194, that sets the flag for now loop pattern number one. Like the pattern one is now a zero. It's, it's set to con con loop on itself forever. That's like this part. And then when you want the, for, for the pattern to transition to the next pattern, then you do like this. You replace the music one with this, 66. So this is the same address as before, is 3101. That's the address for, it's responsible actually for a lot of things. It's responsible, I think, for the third row here and also for this, I'm not sure, or maybe it's the second row. It's responsible for some. There's a bunch of things that are stored in different bits of that of that individual byte. It doesn't matter. Um, the important, like you can do it yourself by just like fl um, turning it off and on and just just um, peeking out the the addresses that are responsible for um, the music that you want to manipulate. So I did so that that I, uh, there's like four numbers, four addresses responsible for the music. I printed them out in a debug function and just turn on that uh, thing on and off and just um, look at what numbers are changing. So the 66 is, if it's off, if this button is off, if it looks like this, then in this address has this number in it. And if you turn it on, then this address has a different number, not 66, but 194. So that's what, basically how we're doing this. So now we get like a seamless transition between between the bass loop and oh, I just mashed a button a, a couple of times. Uh, you get a seamless transition between the bass loop and our main music. I love it so much. So good. All right. So let's see what else is in my list. Oh, there's a ternary. That's ternary. Sorry, ternary. Mm, gotta, gotta learn that. That's going to be the new uh, things like that. Um, so in pretty walls, there is a ternary that we can add. Mm, yeah, here. Uh, TLE equals and tile equals zero and th and three or fifteen. Bam! I think there, I, there might be even more here, but this was like a very obvious one that like like kind of like shouted to me like turn me into a ternary 
Okay, so here's an another problem that's right underneath in Deco Room, something I wrote down that was that struck me. Um, if you think about this, so the way we do this uh, right now is we go through all of the rooms and the first room is gonna be uh, the vase decoration room. Um, but then I actually thought about this a little bit and realized, oh wait, so if we do that, then that means that the first room will always be a vase room, which usually is a no problem at all. But the way we generate the rooms, the first room is typically the big room, the, the one that it has like bigger, um, that starts with a bigger maximum width and size. So this led to the vase rooms being always ginormous, which is fine, you get like a lot of items for that, that's okay. Uh, but um, yeah, didn't feel so great. So it would be better maybe to rewrite this so uh, we're gonna get, we're always getting a random room as, ne as the next room. So let me think about how, what, what's the best way of doing this. Um, I think we might actually do a similar pattern that we did previously where we had like a pot of rooms and then we pull rooms from the pot, right? So yeah, something like this. Let's copy this. This is a really bad because it costs us a bunch of tokens. Um, we might uh, also add rooms, like shuffle the rooms somehow. Might be a worthwhile to maybe have like a function that shuffles around the entries in array. Mm, mm, I don't know, none of these seem like, like very good solutions for this, but yeah, we have to do this. Okay, so in here, let's do something like <coughs> for R and all rooms. Um, yeah, let's do our pot, our pot, and cl open close curly brackets. So this is going to be an empty array for us to store all our rooms. And then instead of the loop here, we're just going to go, going to go f repeat until our pot, um, until our pot, um, hashtag output equals zero. And then here is going to be R, wait a minute. Yeah, um, local R get rind R pot and delete R pot R. Like this. Let's see if this works. Oh, there's a bit. I, I saw it before I pressed. I think I, I, I duplicated that line. Well, this is the first room, it has vases in it, so off the bat, I don't like it. Okay, well, I, we don't know if this is the... Actually, we don't know if that was the first room, this was just the first room we started in. Well, it's a small room that has vases in it, so I guess it's difficult to, to test this, but at least we know that this is not uh, crashing or anything. So I, I consider it this fixed. Another little detail here is when we are generating, when we are spawning the monsters, something I haven't considered is here when we're spawning mobs and infesting a room. So we did something smart here where if we're spawning the monsters in a hallway here, here, we're spawning, the, spawning monsters in a hallway, um, we don't not just check if something is walkable, we actually check if the tile if the tile is is an empty tile, if that's okay. Um, but we didn't do, do the same check here when we're actually infesting the room. So, so it might be worthwhile to doing that. So again, we don't have mobs spawning over uh, the storing location or, or anything, uh, anything other like that. Now that I see it, like it might be worthwhile just this check, this M gets and so forth, that might be worthwhile to maybe Put it in its own thing to kind of save some tokens there but um yeah let's not do that for now it's 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 fine for now uh just make sure that we are not getting any weird um, results yeah no infinite loop or anything let me find an exit oh some guys here Seems good. Haha. <laughs> good. Okay, then I have like two more little bugs or little details. One is that the way stun works is broken. 
Um, so if I'm stun myself and there is no, um, how we call it, there is no monster in nearby, I would carry that stun around with me. That stun will, wouldn't actually go away. And I would then kind of like get stun or the monster would get an extra move as soon as it spots me. Um, so we don't turn off the stun when we um, when we just like normally moving around. Uh, let's that must be some some problem with a little bit update function here. Update game. So normally after the player turn, here's where we get get unstunned. But here, so at the end of the AI function, we remove the stun. However, if um, the AI does nothing, if do AI does nothing, then that stun is never removed. So what we have to do here is we have to actually look in the do AI function and remove the stun here as well. So if moving, do this else and that's that's kind of like a very simple solution here but actually i will probably um um rethink the way we are passing uh, um the turn from the from the player to the monsters like maybe put it in like a, a centralized function it's like pass the turn to the monsters and then the monster will deal with everything and then the monster would say pass the turn to the player um, doing it more organized. I'm not really. I don't really feel well about how the monsters and the player are passing the turn right now. Okay, and there's uh, actually I have two more problems. Um, there's um, some little details. I don't like how sometimes when you get killed, uh, it's kind of difficult difficult to tell. But sometimes if you get killed, uh, maybe we can we can spawn some monsters in our starting location. So sometimes when you get killed, you you the fla your character will flash and then uh, the when the screen fades out it will be actually invisible and that looks odd that looks like you don't really know what happened you don't even see your character anymore you're like very you're very confused about that um so like here when we're gonna add uh monster let's do add monster number three six six and seven six and eight six something along those lines there's a problem here uh, uh, uh. oh add <laughs> um add mob <clears throat> it's not always sometimes you you get away see the, you you weren't visible there for a second so that that has to do with um with the draw function here and so it's here we're, we're blinking and so if the blinking is set up so, such a way that in the moment where the start screen fading out we are kind of blinked out then um, then it will see as a uh, look as if we're invisible so what i do instead here is um, i'm just making sure that we're actually never blinking because the blinking is just when you die um so we're never just gonna blink so we're gonna go sin uh, if this this or m equals p mob. So we are gonna always gonna get drawn. I mean, the player mob is always gonna get drawn, well, no matter what. See now we're kind of like more visible. Um, I think there's uh, it's, the problem still occurs sometimes. So what we um, what you can also do is like make sure that the player mob not never gets deleted from the from the d mob so it's like if and m is not equals p mob something like this i like i did some testing with that and it, it i was sometimes i was still invisible when i died i was kind of hoping that i would get a buck again uh but yeah no it works good so again, these kind of like checks just like some aesthetic checks and finally there's a little bit of a um, sound effect that I, I haven't actually used that uh, is I think very important there is a special sound effect that is um, kind of like a warning sound effect when that kind of pick up uh, a pickup sound effect that is, has a warning built in this one I think yeah this one is picking up and this one is eh, something bad happened. 
Um, and I want this sound effect to show uh, to come up when you want to pick up an item, but your inventory space is full. And I also want to show this up uh, or to play this when uh, an, uh, you break a vase and there is an enemy inside. So let's see. Um, it's here. So this is a uh, message is full. So let, uh, what is the sound effect for that? 60. I actually never, never, never played the good. This is the good sound effect. We should play that as well. Um, this is also sound effect 60. And we never play this, the positive sound effect when we normally pick up this stuff. So let's do that. Mm, and here where we spawn the mob, we also do a 60, uh, the warning sound effect. Just like some additional sound effects. Let's see, oh no, I has, now have these mobs that follow me around. Let's just delete these mobs. The testing mobs. Okay, of course now I will not have any, well, there must be a vast room somewhere, right? That's how we set it up. That's not a vase room. Oh, but it's a big room that is not a vase room, so that's good. That, that means that our uh, random uh, room picker worked. Okay, that was picking up a sound effect. That's good. Oh, wait. Yeah, no, that was. I think that was a bad sound effect. Yeah. Uh, that's a good sound effect. Good. Okay, so uh, these are basically like the small bugs, small details kind of like taken care of. So now we can move over to the big stuff. There's a bunch of little details that I would maybe add here just like to, um, to, uh, to round things up a little bit. Um, okay, so there's like three, maybe three features. Let's see if three is a good number. So um, one fe big important feature that I think a lot of people are talking about, and that's something I would definitely want to implement now. I did some testing with it and it's actually really good, is uh, what we are already talking about, how um, it's kind of good if there is a reminder telling you what different food items do once you um, you discovered it, once you've eaten a food, you want to be reminded of what that food does. So let me first get a bunch of food, uh, or the, you know, the same food items in my inventory, right? So I have like three copies of the same food item, savory wrap. So if I eat it, it's cursed. So now uh, what I want to do is I want to, to, be, to be like a reminder that the savory wrap is cursed. Now you could be like thinking, okay, we don't technically need it. And I would, that would be a valid approach to say like, okay, we don't technically need it. Uh, you could see it as a kind of a challenge for the, for the player to have to actually write down, you know, they have like a little beautiful notebook like this one <laughs> to have to write down all of the food effects that that they do um, and 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 this being like kind of like a skill that is being tested but i think in practice it's just like something that's really annoying like it's fun the first time around you do it but this is supposed to be a game with a high turnaround you know where um, you know, you're you're dying and replaying, dying, replaying, dying, replaying. And, and for those situations, having to write down what the foods always does is gets very tedious very, very fast. And it gets to the point where you forgot to write it down. And so you, um, you kind of like have to guess one more time and you get killed by this and it's very, very infuriating. Okay, so here's how we're gonna do. First, let's think about um, what will happen in the background. So here, when we generate the food names, um, I would add a new type of array. I'm gonna. I'm always looking at my in my prototype that I prepared for that part. Uh, we're gonna call it ITM known. ITM known. 
which is basically telling us for at least for the food items it's telling us for every item but it's going to be just makes only sense for the food items it basically tells us item known equals false which means it's we don't know what this item is then we just want to show the uh, the tool tips for the items that are known where we actually figured out what they are and equally in the gameplay function when we are when we eat something we want to know about that thing so here eat all right so here we're gonna go if item known and it's gonna be item uh, if not item known and only then you show this message that's a, that's not a problem like you would have like these always these messages that show up and tell you what the food does like even if you already know what the food does and the messages would always cover up the actual action the actual animation it would look awkward so we only show the message just once the first time you discover what the food does and in this case if you if you if you not don't know what it is you show the message and you s set the food to be known to be a known food so now we know what this food does and all that we have to do now is kind of like um, show like a little message in the menu um, telling us what um, what this food does if if we know about it now this is a bit of an issue here because it's, it's going to be a bit of a hack you know it's ui it's always a bit of a hack i'm going to create a new function i'm going to call it show hint hint this is going to be a function that kind of like shows a hint of what the food does when we are in the inventory menu when our cursor hovers over a, over a, a thing so first whenever we are about to show a hint we first we're going to show if hint window if that ex already exists if you're already showing some hint because if you're showing some hint then i want to hint wind dot duration to, i want this hint window to disappear and hint wind dot uh, equals to nil being nil hint wind is going to be a variable that, that saves the window that shows our hint and so now we're going to see what kind of item our cursor is being currently um, hovering over so if env wind dot cur that's the cursor of our of our inventory window if that's greater than three which means we are in a lower area where the food might be then we might be talking about some food so this we do this because we're gonna play this show hint function every time we move the cursor. Um, so if we move the cursor outside of our inventory space, so for example, we move it into equipment space, we want the hint hint window if there's any existing to disappear, and uh, then we're not gonna show any other hint windows, just gonna disappear. Okay, so let's grab the item that we're showing. So it's gonna be local item equals inventory. <coughs> in wind dot cur minus three we already did that you know we're just grabbing the position of the cursor we do subtracting three because like this in the menu there's like three spaces above the inventory space for equipment and so forth and then if um if item <laughs> there's a there's a ternary here so uh, type All right, um, no, it's not a ternary. The, the reason I did it if ITM, just in case if you're hovering over a space that has no item in it, an empty space, in that case, the inf um, array would have a nil value in it. So if there is a value in that, in that um, array and the item type of that item that we found here is um, food, if this is a food, then we are actually showing maybe a, a um, a hint of what it is so uh, local txt equals um so now it, it's kind of like de it depends on whether what kind of text we showed it depend that's going to be the text of the um, of the uh, hint window that text depends on whether the item is known or not so this is now the ternary so it's going to be itm known itm and or 
So the or is, is going to be very easy. It's going to be just three equations. So if you know if it's not known, then show the three equation signs. But if it's known, that's going to be a bit of an issue here. We basically, I mean, it's basically we're going to grab this from the gameplay function. This here, this show message here, we're just going to grab that one. That's going to be the the name of the item and the description of the item. So you know, uh, you know the the soft pizza is cursed. You know, um, yeah. So we're gonna plug that right in here, and that's, that should just work. So now we have the text that we want to show, and we just now want to have to create the hint window. So we're gonna go hint wind, and that took me a bit of a time to figure out exactly you know what the positioning is, and, and I want you to go with you through the same process. So it's gonna be fine. Seven eight five seven eight is a good position for this window. Then hashtag txt times four plus seven or something, right? Um, so depending on what how long the text is, the hint is, uh, we divide multiply by four and add seven for the uh, to, um, to account for the border. The height is going to be always thirteen. It's just like one line plus some border stuff, and then finally uh, the actual text. One line of text, like so. Um, there is a bit of an issue here, and that is going to be. Hmm, Look. So first of all, first of all, yeah. Let's let's show a hint when we when we call show show in v. But then, uh, if we use stuff, um, show use no trig use here when we use stuff. So whenever we return from a using to the actual window. We want to let's see use wind duration. That's okay. So here eat, eat and throw, eat, eat, throw and thrash could could all um, result in this. In this. Um, so let's see. Uh, here is where we delete the inventory window and the stat window. And then we show in the inventory. Yeah. Okay. But we show the inventory, and we do the. We do show hint at uh, at the end of show inventory, so we don't have to do it here. So that's good. Um, but here, here's where we delete everything. So we can go, hint wind. Dot dir equals zero, and hint wind equals nil. Uh, I always set the hint wind to nil. Um, um, I mean, I don't have to, right? Maybe I don't have to. Maybe I don't. I'm just ah, uh, whatever. Um, and then there's a bit of a problem here where we do the inventory here update inventory so when we move the cursor we want to always call the hint wind uh, but we don't know if the cursor has moved we do the move menu but we never actually know if the if we actually moved something and i want to call the function every frame so what we want to do is the move menu this function here that just moves the cursor of any kind of menu um, that should actually return whether it's uh, it moved the cursor or not so let's let's, let's make it like this local moved equals false and then here we're going to go moved equals true uh, moved equals true and then return moved so that gives the move menu now returns a a true where when something has moved so here we're going to go if um, move menu current and uh, we are in an inventory then uh, what's the function of that hint show hint right show hint yeah show hint so you know every time we move the cursor inside the window the um, the inventory window I want to show the hint and then finally here um, when we cancel the menu yeah, there's a lot of stuff happening here see just like adding like little box somewhere here adds a lot of stuff hint wind dot dir equals zero when we delete when we close the menu we want to close the hint wind yeah 
I think that's it. Yeah, let's try that. So this is our burger, and we don't know what it is. It correctly, uh, you know, the, this disappears. We, let's trash it. It disappears, that's good. Let's eat it. We know now that this is cursed. And now old burger is cursed. Perfection. Ta -da! <laughs> Wait a minute, I forgot what the <laughs> what the dab is, what the Christian dab is. Good. So hopefully this works now. Um, like it's kind of difficult to tell if everything is peachy uh, or hunky dory here, but it, oh, there's a problem here. Uh -huh. Ah, that's good to know. Haha. -ha. Yeah, sometimes hint wind is nil, and then setting setting it to the duration to zero is bad. So if hint wind, then hint wind dir equals zero. Int. That's correct, right? Mom's pasticcio. Oh man. Let's see if we can throw things. Works correctly. Good. Egg salad. Little detail I wanted to add a screen shake. We haven't added screen shake at all in our prototype. I mean in this in this version. Um I think that's that's something that that's that's that a lot that's a, adds a lot of fun without costing too many tokens. So let's see. Um so, uh, there is, of course, there's a tool that uh, it's going to be. A, I I broke my promise. I'm going to actually add some uh, some code that I had from from a different game. But you know, it's kind of it's screen shake. It's screen shake. Don't worry, Frank. It's screen shake. Here we go. Um, so we're going to put it in tools. It's my uh, famed and very. You know, we had that already in a previous um, um, tutorial. So it's just, it's just a do shake function. And that just basically does the shaking. Um, and we add this do shake function to uh, the draw function at the very beginning. Uh, so here, draw. We're gonna add a do shake. And the important thing is now that we have to sh set the shake to zero at the beginning. Shake zero. So now when we get hit, I want us, uh, I want to the screen to shake. Um, So here, gameplay, uh, hit mob here. Let's go like if def m equals t mob, then shake. Um, let's, let's not add it, but just set it. And then we're gonna also add a bit of a shake when we hit uh, a different, uh, you know, um, a, a enemy mob, something like this. Let's let's see how that works. I'm not sure if I'm shaking. I'm definitely sh it shakes when I get hit. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, it shakes. Maybe could could maybe shake a little bit more. Let's go six. And this could shake out also a little bit more. Let's go eight. Maybe too much. Um, you know what? Let's just shake or just when we get hit. Could this be a turn, Ari? It could, right? Mm. Uh, like this or fine, let's bring it back. Mm -hmm. 
Ah, that sound effect is good. Juicy schnitzel. What does it do? It's blessed. What's the crusty feeling? It's cursed. Oh no. <laughs> Wait, why am I not cursed? I shouldn't be cursed. Oh, because I was blessed before, so it kind of like just removed the blessing, but it didn't actually, didn't actually uh, curse me. That's good. That's good. Good stuff. Good stuff. It works. So let me remove these take item things here. These are just like for testing purposes. Wow, we're doing a lot of things today. Okay, just like little little tweaks, tweakeroonies here. Um, maybe something I would love, love to do is, I already talked about it previously. If we are starting in a uh, room, if our starting location is in a room, I don't want to spawn any monsters in that room. Uh, so let's, let's go to start end. Hmm. I thought it was start end. Start. No, st start end. Okay, whatever. Um, and we're gonna go. I don't know why there was a star there. Hmm. If um, ro room map px py uh, is not equals z or is greater than zero, then and rooms. Uh, Room at pxpy. Um, dot no spawn equals true. Uh, just want to make sure if it's rooms. Yeah. Okay. Um, so now we set like this known uh, no spawn flag for the rooms that um, that we spawned in. Uh, no spawn, no spawn, no spawn, there we go. Um, and then here where we do the mobs, um, we're just not going to infest the room. So um, if placed, no, it's here. Um, Okay, so I'm just gonna go if r dot um, no spa spawn then return zero. And so if we're, if we're getting we're supposed to um, infest a room that has. Um, that has a no spawn, no spawn set, then no spawn or monsters and just re return. We haven't set any monsters. So we're gonna have to get the monsters somewhere else. That's what I'm thinking. Now it's gonna be difficult to test this because you're gonna have to like um, play through this game a bunch of time. Hey, but actually, you know, see here, we are spawned in a room and there's no monsters. So that suggests that maybe uh, we, uh, it worked. Let's hope. Okay, there's a final thing that I want to tweak, and that is going to be uh, another bug-ish kind of situation. I still don't like how the line of sight function works generally. Um, if you play this game a little bit, you realize quite quite often that there are situations where uh, you see the mob, but the mob doesn't see you, and this is partly um, the way we uncover the map. So you remember we kind of like when we see a tile, we uncover all of the tiles surrounding that tile that are not walkable, uh, that are that. Not not buckle, but that that um, cover line of sight. Um, so sometimes you you uncover a tile that has a monster on it, but you don't actually have a direct line of sight to that monster. But the problem is also the line of sight calculations are not symmetrical, um, and that's because of you know the details of how they do this. And you, you can imagine this if there's like two. Uh, tiles and you have to draw alignment between them, but you kind of have to construct this out of blocks. There's different ways of how you can construct the blocks to kind of approximate the diagonal line. And depending on whether, uh, where the two positions, where the dots are, and depending on each other, the algorithm will kind of do, do a slightly different pattern. Um, something you can do here is uh, we can add some symmetry to it uh, by basically saying like, so um, So this is where it kind of like um, defines this sx and dx variable. sx is basically how much um, to increase s and how much to, it's it's fine, it doesn't, it's fine, I don't have to explain. Um, but uh, something I do have to explain here is 
So um, one of these, we're gonna basically flip the start and beginning with each other. And that's something you can absolutely do. So something like, we're gonna always go uh, positive in the y direction, always go positive in the y direction. And if we are negative, Um, in this case, we wait. Yeah, that's good. Uh, if we're negative, then we're just gonna flip x and y around. So x x one, uh, x two equals. Yeah, that's okay. Um, x2, x1, and then y1, y2, y2, y1. Let's me a 2, 1, 2, 1, 1, 2, 1, 2. Okay, that's good. Um, but something we're gonna do is we're gonna do this before we check for the x, it's like this. Basically, um, so if this is our starting location and it goes up, it will construct kind of a different line than if this is the location that has to go down. Like to, if the locations are the same, the line between the locations will be di different generally. That was how it was before. The line, how it constructs the stair patterns will be differently depending on where you start from. And with, with this line, we kind of like make sure that at least in one dimension, so we flip the Y, so we always go positive. So if we have two locations and we would go from the upper location down to the lower location, we're just gonna flip them around. So we go from, always go from lower location. So that way um, we get a, a bit more symmetrical solutions. So at least in the Y direction, um, it will always create the same pattern, no matter if you go like this or like this. It will still be a bit asymmetrical depending on uh, you know the x uh, lo locations, but we added just a little bit more symmetry to this entire thing and more predictability, I think at least. Uh, let me see if maybe we broke the entire code because that would be awkward. Oh, it looks good. This was most noticeable in these rooms that have plants in them, like in these rooms. But yeah, that's seems payment. See how the monster hasn't seen me. See how it's weird how this monster doesn't see me now? I can see them, but they don't see me. That's kind of a bit bad. Now it sees me. And I think that the problem is again that um, I see the plant, and when I see something, um, the, my algorithm, this um, LOS algorithm, let me see, the unfog algorithm, will look a lot of the surrounding tiles. No, unfog tile. Uh, it will look after all of the surrounding tiles. And if they and, and will uncover them. If they are not sight. Yeah, that's weird. I have to I would have to look at this again. It's this situation right now didn't quite maybe behave the way I expected it. It could have been also a sym symmetry issue. Oh, wait. I died, but I didn't hear the sound of dying. This is because everything has moved? Twenty-two and twenty-four. Ah, yeah, I changed. I, I changed something. Twenty-two and twenty-four. So, um, 
Yeah, I'm still not so sure about the line of sight function. Just what we saw right there was 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 causing me some some headaches. I, I that's I think the line of sight function is something, something we have to keep track. Generally, it works, but in this kind of like plants room, it behaves a bit unpredictably, and I'm not sure if that's just like a side effect of just like little details about how the line of sight function works that we cannot actually change, or if we actually made some mistakes somewhere, or if just like generally the plant rooms are a chaotic mess and they're generally interact with a line of sight function that makes them very unpredictable. Maybe that's something that we kind of have to just like suck it, suck up and deal with. But yeah, this was generally uh, my list. There's a little uh, little details that I still want to, could be go through, for example, maybe generating the vase rooms slightly different, when, uh, not like thinking about the surrounding tiles, but maybe just like, just be like very stupid and be like the, the percentage, the chances of vases spawning on the edges is very high. In a corner is extremely high. In the center room, just lowering the percentage of you know how many vases spawn there. Just like a very simple solution there. Um, I would probably just go for something like this, but I'm not like we're, this episode is long enough for, as it is, and I don't think it's that 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 pressing. Uh, some people ask about traps. Um, we had a, a bit of a discussion in the Discord. Um, I decided not to have any traps in it for now that has to do a bit with, with gameplay topics that's something that might be discussing in the next episode but generally um i don't see a sh an easy way to make traps that it's not going to be just like oh you stepped into a trap Blah, just a random punishment you know it's we don't you didn't see the trap you just stepped into it and you just randomly lose in a life and that's especially so frustrating if you step into a trap and you die and and it's just like randomly die you know and it's like maybe floor eight or or seven and so you were almost there but then you died due to the random trap that's by the way that's kind of like surprisingly how often traps and roguelikes and real rogue roguelikes work it's just like a random punishment i don't like it i think this is a bad idea it's a bad game design um so in order to have traps i think you would have to think about you know more systems to for you to interact with traps for you to maybe trigger traps to uh, disarm tracks, to recognize traps. Uh, this would be like a whole new system that we'd have to set up and I think that opens up in a new can of worms. Uh, we had some people in a Discord who actually made traps where just like a tile that you, when you step on it, you just lose uh, uh, some health points. And the idea was that the tile was difficult to recognize. It was difficult to see. It was like similar to a normal tile, but some, some colors were different. That's fine. I think that's a, that might be maybe like the simplest solution to, to do this. But again, I'm not going to do this. Something I'm also like worried that if we're going to have tiles and corridors, you might have a situation where you have to step into traps because it's along the critical path and you, there's no way around it. There's, there's mm, introduced a lot of uh, headache. Mm, but you know you have all the tools we i taught you all of the tools that you need in order to implement you would basically have just like a uh here in a gameplay function here trick step you would basically have a tile and if that tile would just basically do like a mob hit and um, damage you for one one health point or whatever steps on it to put them into one health point. Well, we would have to like do some some tweaking to make sure that the mobs, the enemies that step on the traps, will also get um, get hit by the traps. You know, little details like this. But you know, it's not that important. I think not that difficult for for you to deal with this yourself. Uh, and then finally, I have like one little detail that um, that again we don't have to do it now. But it, I, I noticed that sometimes in gameplay it was a bit frustrating if if there was no chest on the first floor then that quite quite often would set you back quite a, quite a, quite a while because on the second floor the 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 melts come in these enemies come in and it would be difficult to deal with them if you have no armor and no weapon you were you were kind of like on the back foot not too tragic but it might be a good idea to maybe do like a check to make sure that there's always at least one chest on a on the first floor but yeah, these are details. So this is going to be it for for us. This is going to be our final uh, session. If you've seen any bugs, let me know. Be, because I might do like a post, uh, like a PM, PS uh, kind of kind of episode. Um, but I th still want to do one more episode where we're going to talk a little bit about what the next steps would be to develop this game, what are good ways of saving some more tokens are, because right now we just have like pretty exactly 1,000 tokens left. So what would be the next steps after this if we want to save some tokens? I know, oh, I know a good way to save some tokens. Almost forgot about it. You remember the snapshot function? Yeah, we don't need that anymore. That was just like for nice gifts. 
Yeah, let's get rid of those snapshots. Bam! Problem solved. Um, but yeah, like talking about um, some technical issues, some kind of technical solution of how to save some tokens, and then talking about what kind of gameplay decisions we would have to step through in order to turn this little prototype, this little uh, vanilla kind of um, template into like a full-fledged, really polished roguelike. So uh, again, the final code will be in the doobly-doo down, downstairs, and uh, hopefully uh, OMG Mock will also upload it on the... Um, on the github as always get a t-shirt today i'm still not wearing a t-shirt but there's gonna be a t-shirt link downstairs that supports this channel and you should join our discord channel and i want to see your roguelikes post post your roguelikes that we develop, develop based on this in the in our discord channel that would be really, really great see you on the final episode next time guys bye bye <laughs>